We're going to finish up chapter 2 in Genesis. If you're uh, visiting our church, I'm Pastor Casey. Uh, We preach out of the Bible every Sunday, and we've been in the book of Genesis. So we're going to be finishing up chapter 2 today, so turn there, if you will, with me. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He had brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is the word of the Lord. So of all the things that God had made over the course of this time and and so far, everything that God had made, he had declared good. He made the sun and the moon and the stars, and he said, it is good, and the sky and the sea, it is good, and the birds of the air, the fish, the beasts of the field, it is good, it is all good. And in fact, when God was finished creating everything, as we're going to see today, he said it is very good. But for the first time in the text, we see this phrase, and it begins right here in verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good. It is not good for man to be alone. Why not? Why isn't it good for man to be alone? When I was in uh, uh, sixth grade, I was really excited because uh, going into seventh grade, you could start taking shop class. And so in seventh grade, I had this incredible shop teacher, Mr. Downer, Dean Downer. He was an incredible man. And he taught us two very important things when you would go into wood shop. Don't be afraid of power tools, but never disrespect them because they can kill you. Those are the two things that he taught us. <laughs> Don't be afraid of power tools, but they can kill you. So that means you need to respect them. But he didn't just tell us this, and he didn't just show us how to use the tools. He said that you need to do this yourself. And so we would buy lumber, bring it to wood shop, and he would first show us how, but then he would have us do it. So every tool, the planer, the joiner, the bandsaw, the five horse cabinet saw, we had to use all these tools ourselves. We had to feel their power and potential to destroy fingers but also the potential for them to create something beautiful and lovely. We had to do this by experience because every good teacher knows, and if you're a teacher in here, you'll know what I'm talking about. Every good teacher knows you don't give students a fish. You teach them how to fish so that they can go get fish on their own. So God was about to teach Adam, by way of experience, something that he needed. And first, God declared, it is not good for man to be alone. God is about to create a woman. And for some of you are like, wait, isn't that Botticelli's <laughs> The Creation of Venus? Um, yes, but I thought it would make a, a good background uh, because it's, it represents uh, who a woman is, at least the painting does. When God created Adam, he knew that the complete picture of the image of God would include the binary of a man and a woman. But Adam didn't know this yet, and God wasn't about to just tell him, because God did that with everything else up to this point. 
God gave Adam three functions. Procreate, rule the world, and eat, subdue the earth. Fill it with beauty and meaning and purpose and art and music. Fill the earth, subdue it. And here, I've given you materials in the ground that you can use, gold and onyx and resin. I've put you in the middle of the garden. I've made this place beautiful and every tree you can eat from. Every tree. But do not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden because the day that you eat of it, you will die. You will become disconnected from me and you will choose to go your own way. But I promise that way leads to death. He'd given Adam literally everything that he needed to function properly, to flourish, to thrive, except for one thing. And God wasn't just going to give it to him. God wanted to show Adam that he needed it. So, verse 19, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Adam was beginning to see something. He was beginning to to see that all of the animals had something that he did not. And perhaps Adam even began to think about what God wanted him to do and the functions that he gave to him. It's not good for man to be alone because by nature, because we're made in the image of God, we are relational beings. We're intended to be connected first and foremost to God, but also to each other. And Adam had no other. Adam could not have dominion over the earth alone. He couldn't do it alone. Why is this? Well, because Adam could not procreate alone. And God has always intended for the image of God to be reflected as a human binary with male and female. So God brought all the animals before him, and and he's looking at the animals, and he's beginning to name the animals, and whatever he called the animal, that was its name. But no suitable helper was found for Adam. He began thinking, (laughs) something is missing. I need something that all of these animals have that I don't. And so uh, think about it for a second. I think you might remember me saying that Adam had all of his mental capacity at this point. He's a perfect, flawless human being that God had created in his image. So he's absolutely brilliant with the ability to name all of the animals. Now, did he name all, every single creature in the, on the whole earth? Well, the scripture is silent on this. It doesn't necessarily say that he named the grasshopper and then the black locust and the cricket. We don't know, and it wasn't, he wasn't naming them Latin names like Bulpus Bulpus. This, is, you know, this, is a, this isn't what happened. But look at the text. So he, he formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. What's happening here? Well, remember, this isn't a science book. It's not a textbook. So we're not asking math questions here. Like, how long would it take him to name all those animals? Well, if he took five minutes to name each animal, that's not what we're doing here. Because remember, we're not asking how in this book. We're asking who. So what is God doing and, and what is Adam doing? God is showing Adam his need, and Adam is looking at the animals, and he's saying, the birds of the air, for that is what I will call them, birds. And he he may have given names to individual birds, but he's looking at the sky, so he's looking up, and he's saying, the birds, that one and that one are the same. That one and that one are the same. The birds have a mate. Then he looks down, and he looks at the beasts of the field, and he said, I'll call them livestock. And those over there, the cow, that one and that one has a mate, and 
over here, that one and that one has a mate, and they have mates too. Now, it doesn't say that he named the fish of the sea, because that would require some scuba gear. But he, he perhaps could have even looked out at the ocean and saw the dolphins swimming together and the whales cresting together. He could very well have seen every creature high and low, and for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now, uh, here in the 21st century, we, we scoff at this word, helper, you know, as if, uh, as if it's a lesser thing. Oh, Adam needed a helper. Like, for Adam, no suitable helper was found to make him a ham sandwich on his lunch breaks. No suitable helper was found to do the laundry and do the dishes and take the kids to soccer practice. And, you know, this, this is how, what we think when we think of helper. Now, if you've ever been married by me, which there is a couple, a uh, few people who have, I preach on this every time I marry somebody together. And it's this word right here, the word for helper, eitzer. You may have heard me preach on this before, eitzer. It's very important to understand this because, no, it's not a lesser word, it, quite the contrary. It's not an assistant manager. Listen to how the authors of the Theology Work Project put it. They, they put it this way, and it's perfect. God created the woman as an eitzer. It occurs 21 times in the Old Testament. Two times it means the first woman, the helper. We see it twice in this passage. Three times it refers to powerful nations that come to aid Israel in conquering or vanquishing an enemy that God has judged. But 16 times this word, eitzer, same word here, is used to refer to God, the Holy Spirit, as our helper. Isn't that incredible? And what God is doing is he's showing Adam that he needs help beyond himself. He's not an independent creature. And there's something else going on here. This is connected to how God is going to interact with his people throughout all of human history. It's connected to the story arc of the scriptures, that man is dependent upon things outside of himself because he's not God. Man must be connected and in relationship with God. God in order to function, as we looked at last week. But here we're going to see that human beings have to be connected and interconnected with each other in order to perform the functions that God has laid out as his design. So how does God do it? God shows Adam his need. Adam recognizes his need. He feels his need. And then God does this. So the Lord God, verse 21. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Into a deep sleep. Our uh, illustrious youth pastor recently had some surgery done. Uh, he had some uh, wisdom teeth removed, uh, some uh, construction in his teeth. And the doctor, uh, Eric Wynn, <laughs> put, put him to sleep. And I'll bet Aaron was glad. Because if he was in that much pain, a week after surgery, imagine how much pain you are in while the surgery is happening. So I'm very thankful for the 21st century, for the 20th century, and anesthesia. It's excellent. But right here, at the very beginning of time, God, crea God created Adam and then immediately performed surgery on him. And this is the, the first surgery that we see. And like the gracious God he is, he puts Adam to sleep. Uh, because uh, I, I found this diagram. It's very helpful. If you crack your ribs, uh, you will fear, feel tenderness to the chest and back and extreme pain when taking a breath. And uh, if, you, if all else fails and you can't tell if you've broken your rib, um, you will feel crunchiness <laughs> under the skin. It will sound like Rice Krispies. <laughs> so it, I'm curious. Anybody broken a rib here? Yeah. Painful, huh? Yeah, not, not fun. When you, when you breathe in, it's, it feels like you're breaking your ribs again and again. Crunchy. I love that. Very helpful. So God 
does this incredible surgery. And, and, and look how it happens. He puts the man into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made, fashioned a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Why a rib? Why didn't, you know, God made Adam by just taking the dust, forming a man, and breathing life into him? Why didn't God just find dust somewhere else and create a woman? God was doing something here to show you and I and all humans for the rest of history, that a woman comes out of a man and is in every way his equal. See, the way that God creates Eve is different from anything else in all of creation, even more unique than the way that God created Adam from the dust, because Eve is not just created from something that already existed. She was created from someone who already existed. The significance of this has to be understood. When God created the woman, he didn't just start with dust. He used a part of the man he had already created. And instead of creating the woman as a separate being from Adam, he created her with the same flesh, the same bone. From the one, he made two. And he used a rib to do it. This is really interesting um, because there might even be a biological reason that, that God used a rib. This, uh, this is from eLife Science Magazine. Fractures to major bones often heal slowly or incompletely, especially in the elderly. And large bone injuries do not repair naturally. You need intervention. By comparison, however, rib bones show an unusual capacity to regrow and repair themselves, even when a large portion of the bone is damaged. Previous research suggests that the connective tissue around the ribs helps to support and coordinate bone healing, but it's currently not clear why ribs have a greater capacity to repair these large injuries compared to other bones. God knew because he had made Adam. He knew this. Now, that may be the reason why God chose the rib, and as incredible as that is, I think it's the symbolic nature of the rib that gives us the real reason. The Lord God intended for Adam to understand that Eve didn't come from somewhere outside. Eve came from within. Eve came from his side to show that they would be co-rulers, that they would be co-heirs, that they would be ruling and flourishing and procreating side by side, side by side that she was his equal, and that he and she were intended to rule side by side. And this is why Adam says in verse 23, oh, and actually, I want to go back to this. Before Adam says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, look how God's creating the woman. He starts cosmically, right? Genesis 1-1, the heavens and the earth, all things that that exist. Then in six days, he forms... He takes the the created universe and he orders it in six days and he focuses on from the cosmos to the earth. Then he focuses on the garden and he plants the garden. Then he focuses on the man and he forms him out of dust and breathes life into him. And then he takes a rib out of the man and creates the woman. And it's only after this that God says it is very good. He goes from cosmic all the way down to the pinnacle of his creation, human beings, and then the woman. And the woman, this woman, is the only human being in all of human history who will come out of a man. All other human beings after this will always ever come out of a woman. Only God can do this kind of thing. Only God can do this. And so Adam recognizes that this, just as I looked in the air and saw the birds with their counterpart and the beasts of the field and saw their counterpart and all the livestock, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And she will be called, notice Adam is still in naming mode, she will be called 
woman, for she was taken out of man. Ish and Isha. Man out of man. A man and a woman. And here's the symbolic reason. Ephesians 5 actually sheds some light on this for us. For this reason, and this is a direct quote from this passage in Genesis chapter 2, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. God was putting forward a picture of his love for the church. And this is, this is truly a mystery and truly profound. Think of all the, the songs that have ri- been written, the movies that have come out, the books that have been written, trying to describe what happens when a man loves a woman, right? You, when a man and a woman... I grew up in a church where we had a pastor who would sing very poorly like once a month or so, and it was hilarious, and I was like, I'm never going to do that. <laughs> well, I guess I just did. I, I kind of do that a lot. So it's, it's this incredibly profound mystery, what happens between a man and a woman when they meet, and what happens, the conversations that happen. The dreams and visions that happen. What happens inside of you even chemically? God designed human beings to function this way, to fulfill procreation, ruling, and even fellowship, deep fellowship, and eating together. It's for this reason, because a woman came out of a man, out of one flesh, that when a man and a woman come together, they become one flesh, and they have the ability to create new human beings. God has given them this supernatural ability and physical ability to create new people and flourish and populate the earth. This is an incredible, incredible thing. And at the very end, it says, verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is, a, this is as beautiful as it gets right here. This is, this is heaven and earth in the same place. God is there walking with them in the cool of the evening. They have all things provided for them to flourish and thrive. They now have each other's counterpart so that they can come together as one flesh and procreate and fill the world with beauty and purpose and meaning, just as God had filled them with beauty and purpose and meaning, they can, they can flourish. They can enjoy the wealth of God's rich grace and love, giving to them all things that they need. And they didn't even need clothing, not just because physically the, the environment was perfect, but because they were clothed in the righteousness of God. They could stand in the presence of a holy God because they had been made holy and they had a relationship with him. And it was a true, real relationship. And we know this is true. We know it's real because God didn't force them. In the middle of the garden, he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil right next to the tree of life. Symbolic, yes, but had very real world consequences. They could choose God or choose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, the day that you do, all of this will unravel. All of this will fall apart. You will die because you will become disconnected from me. You're intended to be in a relationship with me. And the day you choose to disconnect yourself from me and not trust me, that only I can judge between what is good and evil, then you will become the judge, and you will find where sin actually resides without me. We haven't gotten to chapter 3 yet, and so I just want to bask in this for a second. Because <laughs> there's, you know, there's uh, a thousand pages in this book, and, and, and this is the one where we're doing okay. <laughs> 
And, and, and then the rest of the book is the story of our total need for God, our total dependence on God. When Adam sat there and he looked at all the animals and he thought, I have a great need. I have a desire and and I can't procure it. I can't fill it. I can't make it happen. This is also symbolic of what will happen with human beings for the, the rest of creation until Jesus returns. We all, all of us, have sinned and fallen short of God's glory and his intended purpose for us. And we have a deep need for God. We have a deep need to be connected with him again. We've all been disconnected. We're going to see that in a couple weeks. We've all been disconnected from God and we need to be connected with him again. And the sin that we feel in our hearts, that we feel ashamed of and we feel guilty of before Christ That is to cry out to us in the same way that Adam saw his need for a mate that only God could provide. It is intended for us to cry out to God our need for a Savior that only he could provide. Only God can do that for us. Let's pray together and uh, just that God would remind us of our need for him. God, as we look at this passage and we see your intended purpose for human beings that... um, that we are made in your image as male and female, and that marriage is not what gives us um, significance. It's not the end-all, be-all, but it is a picture of what you have done for us. It's a picture of how you intended us uh, to be in relationship with one another, but ultimately in relationship with you. It's a picture of the way that you loved the church and sacrificed and that you are the one who provided God. So, Father, I pray that you would help us uh, to live out this reality and this truth that we've got to be connected to you. We have to be in your word. We have to be connected with other people who know you. Convict us of sin. Allow us to see the sin in our life that we might repent and turn to you with dependence. That we might humble ourselves before you that you would make us new. Thank you, Jesus, for the truth of your word, the power of your word. Thank you for Uh, what all that you've given us for life and for godliness. We surrender ourselves to you as we continue to worship and even as we walk out the door this Sunday. We love you, God. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Uh, I'm Tom Garrett, and this morning I'm up here representing uh, the uh, VCF Missions Committee. Uh, You may have noticed that uh, once a month we have what we call a missionary moment where we kind of highlight one of the... uh, missionaries that we support uh, as a church. And uh, a long time ago, months ago, we set a schedule, and I was scheduled in the month of November uh, to be up here to talk to you about the ministry of uh, a Romanian pastor by the name of Christy Petrichow, uh, just an unbelievable guy who, uh, who loves uh, the Lord. And uh, you may recall when we had Gift World uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we listed certain gifts that uh, you could give uh, to missionaries. And the gifts that were listed for Christy uh, were to pray for a miracle, for healing uh, from his cancer, uh, for his family, for his wife Morella, uh, her, his kids Robert, uh, Andrea, and Naomi. Uh, that uh, they would have comfort uh, and, uh, and peace, and that uh, there would be fellow believers that would rise up and, and uh, continue the ministries that he wasn't able to perform at that time. Well, it's with sadness that I tell you uh, that on Thursday, uh, the Lord called him home, uh, and he, uh, he passed away. Uh, so I'm going to give you kind of a little trip through how we connected and a little bit uh, about uh, Christie's ministries. So just very briefly, uh, Trinity Baptist Church, now Grace Bible Church, gentleman by the name of Sean Mills uh, attended there, uh, and uh, a a number of people from that church ended up coming here to VCF. Sean went uh, into the mission field with Food for the Hungry, in Romania, and uh, he met uh, Christy, and uh, they became fast friends. And uh, in 
2006, I think, the Food for the Hungry uh, ministry, uh, it left uh, Romania because the Romanian economy had pro improved to the point where they became members of the European Union. And they no longer met the criteria uh, for what that uh, ministry was doing. So at that time, I think Sean, probably to Randy and Cheryl Rossness and maybe others here, uh, sought uh, to help support uh, Christie. And uh, that uh, is, uh, has how we got connected. I met Christie and Morella one time, I think in about 2011, uh, when they were here visiting. And since then, for 11 years, I've had the privilege of uh, being in contact with him, primarily through email and, and text. Uh, but what a wonderful man and what, what an encouragement to me just uh, to be part of his life and to be able to represent uh, us to, to him. So I'm going to, uh, Robin, if you would go ahead and start the slides. I'm going to just show you a few pictures, some of them not so good. Uh, but this is their church service, and uh, that is uh, Christy uh, preaching to the flock uh, there at, uh, in his town in Romania. Next one, Robin. Uh, this is uh, a Sunday school class and the youth group. Christy did everything. He was the pastor of the church. He preached. Uh, he was the youth leader, he taught Sunday school, uh, he, uh, he did it all. Next. Uh, this is Christy baptizing a new believer. Next. Uh, one of the things that uh, was, was a big event every year uh, was discipleship camps for the youth. Uh, and there was a lot of high altitude hiking Involved. That's Christy uh, with uh, with some of the youth in the church. Next, uh, this is another picture from uh, from the hike. Randy, you're not up there, are you? Yeah. Okay. Next. Uh, one of the things that Christy was very concerned about. He 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 was so thankful for the support from our church, but he worked so hard to become self-sufficient. And he was a farmer. They had an apple orchard, and uh, this is a picture of he and his daughter. Uh, they picked apples every year. Uh, they made juice. Uh, they sold the juice to help support uh, the family. He was always concerned about an early snow and frost uh, that would kill the apples. Next. This uh, was their home at one time. They, cre created, uh, they uh, transformed it into a B&B, &B, uh, and they rented it out. Uh, again, uh, to raise income for the family that wasn't supplied by his church. Next. Uh, this is a vehicle uh, that we helped uh, uh, be purchased for him to use in conducting tours. So he had tourists, he conducted tours, uh, he shared the gospel with him, and then they stayed in his B&B. &B. Next. Uh, here we have a group, and you may recognize some of them there. There's Randy and Cheryl, and there's Eric and Bo Totemeyer back there, and that is uh, Christy and Morella on either side of Cheryl there in the front uh, on a visit that uh, folks from VCF made over there. And next. And uh, I think this is the last one. This is one that he sent me on, a, on an Easter morning. Uh, and just... Uh, Showing God's beauty and, uh, uh, you know, what that means to us uh, to wake up on an Easter morning and uh, to see the sun coming up like that. So, uh, Christy was an amazing man. Uh, you know, 1 Peter 1.8 says that though you have not seen him, uh, you love him. Uh, Christy... Uh, did not see the Lord while he was here, but he loved him, he served him well, uh, and he, uh, he finished the race. And now uh, he has, uh, he's experiencing his reward. Uh, he is with the Lord, and uh, he sees clearly. So, Randy, where are you? I'm going to have Randy, who, uh, uh, Randy and Cheryl, who spent more time, I think, with the Petrichows than uh, anyone else here, just say a few words.
Thanks, Tom. Uh, m my experience with the Kirsi was remarkable. You know, the Bible says that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And I felt so much that way with him as I do many of the, the guys here in the church. And uh, it's such a wonderful relationship. And to see him completely sold out in his ministry, we Zoomed him for every other week for the last year and saw his uh, health just uh, fading every single time that we got on with him. So the last time we talked to him was, uh, I mean, Zoomed with him was uh, two weeks ago, I believe. And we knew that that would be the, the last time that we would ever get to see him. But uh, wonderful man. He was just uh, committed to Jesus and... Uh, Every moment of his life was spent just uh, sharing with people. And in 2004, I went over there to join uh, <clears throat> Christy and uh, uh, Sean Mills to, to go to a summer camp. And it was really one of the most exciting experiences I've ever had in my life. There were about 18 uh, young people there, and uh, they were so creative and so much into it. There were a few troubled kids that really needed to know the Lord and to have the experience of sharing with uh, Christy and uh, just ran a marvelous uh, camp there. We set up in tents around this uh, open area just miles and miles away from any kind of civilization. And I woke up one morning in my tent and there was a cow coming in through the, uh, <laughs> through the uh, flaps there. And so it was uh, really exciting, but the kids just jumped in and did all kinds of creative skits and things like that. So. Had a wonderful time there, and uh, Christy was in the Roman the uh, Russian army in the first part of his life, his young life, and came out of that and took his uh, Christian perspective uh, into uh, a church there, and he uh, mingled with all of the uh, <clears throat> uh, people who were selling things, the gypsies in the community, which were really just considered total outcast there, and but he would go see them, and he would go in the, to the poorest areas and took us with him to see these people and how they lived, and it was just uh, very, very sad, but he just engaged each and every one of them and had a love for people and a direct contact with uh, Jesus. So uh, his death has led to the first day of his perfect life with Jesus, and I'm so happy for him, but I, I miss him, and... Uh, just uh, thank you for this opportunity to get to tell you a little bit about him and his family. So thank you.